I want you to ask, how close would it, another country have to put nukes of their own to the U.S. before the U.S. decided that that was a threat of nuclear war? Mind you that the U.S. is the only one to use nukes on another country so far, how close would it have to be for the U.S. to act like another country is a threat to them? I'll give you a few minutes to think about that while I, uh, sip me some honest tea here. Because, ultimately, the U.S.'s position on this is massively hypocritical. And the U.S. has been putting missiles and nuclear-capable shit very close to Russia for a long time. In a way that Russia did, only to be responded to with the Cold War and a bunch of other similar wars um, by the U.S. Because basically, the U.S., ever since the closure of World War II, has treated Russia like it's excuse to do anything. We're working with Nazis. We're working with the Mujahideen. We're working with South American drug gangs. We're working with literally anyone. Hey, it's awesome. We're just fighting communism. And Russia. And that excuse carried over. Except now the primary proponents of that excuse are Democrats and not Republicans. Doesn't mean it's not a bipartisan thing, mind you. It basically is. But the primary driver of this is Democrats and not Republicans. And there's a significant amount of uh, research that indicates that a significant amount of the sort of uh, aggression that comes to the U.S. and allies is blowback. You know, Ron Paul gave a fantastic speech sometime if you want to watch it. It's just what if. You can look it up on YouTube still. You know? How close would another country have to be? Or how many foreign bases for other countries would have to be in the U.S. on an occupation basis before the U.S. decided that was an act of war? I'm guessing one. I'm guessing it would stop before it was one. And I'm guessing that the missile answer is zero would be allowed, and if one happened, it would be used as an excuse for action against that country. Sort of like already happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, when the U.S. and its allies are putting so many weapons on, like, such close proximity to Russia, I don't think the U.S. is in any position to claim that that's not a threat of war. Unless they're going to admit that it was a lie before when the U.S. decided it was a threat of war to have an entire body of water in the way of Cuba and the U.S., but still have missiles there. If that was okay, um, then this is okay. And if this is not okay, then that's not okay. Because the U.S. is actively putting them on the border of Russia. Don't believe me? Well, Finland has joined the latest NATO attempt to control this situation um, by expressing willingness to host nuclear weapons on the border with Russia. It's the new Cold War, y'all. It's the new brinksmanship. And, and it's not just Finland either. It's the entire continent of Europe, where the U.S. accelerates its plans to deploy upgraded nukes to Europe. And this is like Politico reporting this. This isn't some super like, like edgy, like alt media site. This is fucking Politico telling you this. So maybe listen. 
You know, even if you're one of those people that requires a mainstream source, Politico is on my side here. The U.S. is sending nukes to the border of Russia and sending a significant amount of nukes to Europe. Taunting a world power. And we wonder why other countries might be starting to see things a little bit differently. We wonder why other countries might be aligning with Russia, maybe because the U.S. and NATO are insane for power. And it doesn't matter who gets hurt. It doesn't matter what kind of warlike environment this creates. What matters is that the U.S. maintains their power. So, I thought it was valuable to bring that up because here's two articles from, uh, from Foreign Policy magazine. One about how Iran is now at war with Ukraine. You know, it's funny. It's funny. Uh, the Western response to women's rights violations in the Middle East is only really strong when that country is at some sort of threat to the U.S. It's not really strong just because it's a women's rights issue. This hijab thing, that woman, she's being used as a political football to advance the general goals of the globalists. I'm not saying that she deserved what she got, and I'm not saying I'm on team theocracy, what I am saying is that the U.S. has ripe reason to be against Iran because Iran hasn't been on the program for a while and is now aligning with Russia. And, and in what way is it aligning with Russia? Um, if you look at this, this source here, um, which, by the way, you can access for free on Archive, which is what you have to do to unblock the article, um, if you look at this source, it says, for the first time, Iran is involved in a major war on the European continent. Iranian military advisors, most likely members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, are on the ground in occupied Ukraine and possibly Belarus to help Russia rain down deadly Iranian kamikaze drones on Ukrainian cities and civilian infrastructure. According to an Israeli news report citing a Ukrainian official, 10 Iranians have already been killed in a Ukrainian attack on Russian positions. Tehran is now preparing to up the ante by providing Russia not only with potentially thousands of additional drones, but also for the first time with two types of Iranian-made ballistic missiles to supplement Rus Russia's own dwindling stocks. Tehran's military support is already making its deadly mark on the war, but the geopolitical consequences extend much further. By escalating its support for Russia's imperial attempt to subjugate Ukraine, Iran hopes to advance its own imperial project in the Middle East. That's what they want you to think, anyway. That's what they really like you to think. They would really like you to think that Iran is some exclusively terrible imperialist threat. Additionally, there's another article from Foreign Policy where it's like, Russia's recruiting Afghan commandos. Wow, that sounds familiar. It sounds a whole lot like what the U.S. did with the Mujahideen in the Middle East. Or is the U.S. the only group that's allowed to do that? Abandoned Special Forces veterans are getting job offers for a very different kind of battlefield. Members of Afghanistan's elite National Army Commando Corps, who were abandoned by the U.S. and Western allies when the country failed, fell to the Taliban last year, say they are being contacted with offers to join the Russian military to fight in Ukraine. Multiple Afghan military and security sources say the U.S. trained light infantry force, which fought alongside U.S. and other allied special forces for almost 20 years, could make the difference Russia needs on the Ukrainian battlefield. 
Afghanistan's 20,000 to 30,000 volunteer commandos were left behind when the U.S. ceded Afghanistan to the Taliban in 2021. Only a few hundred senior officers were evacuated when the republic collapsed. Thousands of soldiers escaped to regional neighbors as the Taliban hunted down and killed loyalists to the collapsed government. Many of the commandos who remain in Afghanistan are in hiding to avoid capture and execution. The United States spent almost $90 billion building the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Although the force as a whole was incompetent and handed the country over to the Taliban in a matter of weeks, the commandos were always held in high regard, having been schooled by U.S. Navy SEALs and the British Special Air Service. So, the U.S. trained these guys, and now they're enemies of the U.S., I wonder if I ever heard that pattern before. I wonder if this follows the exact pattern that's long been established by U.S. foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. I kind of wonder if maybe I wrote a couple articles about this, you know? Maybe on a site called Agoris Nexus. And if, if these articles are completely borne out at this point to be true, you know, like... Maybe the articles that I wrote uh, had some value. And people who've been following me for some time know that. But, you know, it, it, would, it would be pretty, pretty bad to just plug some articles here. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So here's the first article that I'm going to plug. Uh, will he, won't he, he won't, Afghanistan is too profitable to leave. This is an article about how the U.S. government uh, created the Afghan terror threat, the, like, Al-Qaeda and ISIS terror threat, and how they did it using Russia as an excuse. How they did it, and now they've got this enemy that they can, you know successfully uh, use to wage a forever war. But it's not a forever war, people would say. Well, except that they didn't really leave. They've been still conducting military exercises in there, and they only took out U.S. troops officially. They didn't say anything about, we're never going to send in any private military contractors, which they have. Um, and they didn't, you know, actually leave if they had enough actionable intelligence to assassinate generals and carry out operations in that country. And you want to say it fell to the Taliban foreign policy? This is why I tell people to, you know, do this archive thing, because nobody should be paying you or giving you any sort of contact information in exchange for your articles when you're going to be propagandizing like this. Um, but the U.S. made the Taliban. The U.S. made the Taliban because it's a result of splinter factions off U.S.-created Middle Eastern assets. And because this splinter faction uh, coalescence that formed the Taliban uh, eventually would get tens of millions of dollars from the U.S. to criminalize opium. And it sure would... Only, you know, so that they could get a stockpile of it that they could sell uh, as a monopoly on the black market. Um, which they did. Exports really fucking spiked and their profits massively fucking spiked. The U.S. created the basis for and then funded the, ex the, the extension of the Taliban government. That's, that happened. Not making this up. So, when the U.S. says that the Taliban is somehow a thing that Afghanistan fell to, I call bullshit. I don't think that the U.S. has any business in this conversation. And, for those of you who are going to tell me that I'm being somehow evil because I'm bringing all this up, um, and, you know, oh, how dare you? Ukraine is just an innocent country. Why, are, why, why, why is a country not at war with them 
shelling their cities. Well, hey, you know, you could ask the same question about any number of U.S. allies, not the least of which were Ukraine for a significant period of time and its involvement in the Donbass. But, you know, in more specific and recent terms, let's talk about something else and the fact that Israel um, is attacking the Syrian capital. Today's attack mirrored the others with locals reporting explosions and some damage caused, and state media saying Syria had intercepted a number of the missiles fired. As with Friday's attack, there's no word of any casualties, though it isn't unusual for casualties to only be reported days later. Monday's strike saw a Syrian soldier wounded, but again mostly just damage. It's not clear why Israel's attacks are so intermittent on Syria, as they've been attacking for years, but will sometimes go for a span with no strikes at all. Israel claims neutrality on the Syrian war, but only ever attacks the government. <laughs> so, that's happening. The U.S. is still supporting the Yemen genocide. The U.S. is still supporting... Um, pretty much anything that advances their interests. And they do it a lot of the time just by pointing at Russia and saying, Russia, or just by pointing at communism and saying communism. They've used this excuse to work with who would become terrorists. They've used this excuse to work with active Nazis. They've used this excuse time and time again, and they will keep on using it as long as the common person is poorly informed. So, I figured I would give you better information. And you can do with that what you will. I assume that most people will hate me for it, uh, who even watch this video, and I assume most people won't share this video so that people are better informed. But if you do decide to, you'll be helping a lot of people get a lot better information than the mainstream would tell them. Because the U.S. It has no business criticizing anybody else's designs on imperialism. Not Iran. Not Russia, not anyone. The U.S. leads an imperialist hegemony. And yeah, it's bad when anyone does it. But it's bad when anyone does it. And nobody should be hurling fucking moral indignation and righteous consternation at the fucking people who are doing the same thing they are. It's asinine. And since... It's forming the basis for a massive tens of billions of dollar racket uh, that is $80 billion deep now. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the reason they don't want you to think this way. And maybe that's why it's worse to think this way than to think, hey, I'm just going to um, look at some facts that disagree with you, maybe. Because that's the real shit. We have information, and Inf information is power. You just need to wield that power unashamedly. And don't do anything to let them take any of that from you. Because we need all, all the help we can get. We need all the information and all the hands on deck. And we need people to be unafraid of talking about the root of the problem, which is not Russia or communism. It's the state. And that's why we have to do everything in our power to smash the fucking state.